Hey there everyone, time for another video. In 2012, Intel released the Ivy Bridge line of processors for the 1155 socket, which were basically a die shrink from 32 nanometers to 22 nanometers of the Sandy Bridge architecture. Some Ivy Bridge based processors saw their launch in April and May of 2012, but it wasn't until September that year that they launched the Pentiums based on Ivy Bridge, one of which was the Pentium G2120, a 55 watt TDP dual core processor with no turbo boosting or hyper threading which ran at 3.1 GHz and supported up to 32 GB of DDR3 memory up to a maximum selectable frequency of 1600 MHz, up from the 1333 MHz max of the Sandy Bridge Pentiums. The G2120 featured I think around 634 million transistors built on the previously mentioned 22 nanometer fabrication process, although I couldn't actually find a definitive number on the amount of transistors this has. It also had 64 KB of L1 cache per core, 256 kilobytes of L2 cache per core, and 3 megabytes of L3 cache, which was shared between both of the Pentium's two cores. It does also have integrated graphics, which ran at a maximum frequency of 1.05 GHz, but we don't really care about that for this video. Originally, the G2120's official launch price was $75, US, although actual prices may have varied, which today is around $83, US, adjusting for inflation, which is also around £63 or €73. Euros. I bought it for only £4, however at CEX in the UK you can buy it for around £5 now when it comes back in stock, or for as little as $9.25 on eBay in America at the time of writing. As usual, I'll be putting the Pentium through its paces in some games and some benchmarks as well, including the new for this video, Cinebench R20, to get an idea of just how the G2120 performs in 2019. The rest of the system I'll be using today features an ASRock Z68 Pro 3 motherboard, with 8GB of DDR3 RAM at 1600MHz, a MSI GTX 1080 Armour OC Edition graphics card to eliminate any potential bottlenecks, Windows 7 Ultimate 64-bit, and a Fantex TC14PE cooler to keep the Pentium cool, so let's get on with the first test. First up is the newly released Cinebench R20, a benchmarking tool based on the engine from Maxon's Cinema 4D software. It uses all of your processor's cores to render a photorealistic 3D scene and presents a score at the end based on how long it took to render the image. I'm running the benchmark three times and averaging the scores to present a reliable representation of what the G2120 is capable of. As it's a new benchmark for the channel, I don't have any comparison scores, although there are some built-in scores from Maxon's own testing prior to the release. At the Pentium G2120's stock speed of 3.1 GHz, it managed scores of 452, 452 and 453, for an average of 452.33 points. Overclocking wise, Ivy Bridge processors with locked multipliers face the same issues with overclocking that Sandy Bridge processors do, in that how far you can raise the base clock is very limited. It did however manage to increase the base clock from 100 to 106.2 MHz before the PC would no longer boot. This gave a frequency of 3.29 GHz and a memory clock of 1698.2 MHz. With the small overclock, the scores did increase a little, with the three tests now scoring 479, 480 and 485 respectively, for an average score of 481.33, a 6.4% increase in score. Firestrike Physics is a part of the DirectX 11 Firestrike benchmark in the 3D Mark suite of tests, commonly used by overclockers and other tech YouTubers, and is heavily dependent on the processor and not the graphics card. And like Cinebench, I'll be running Firestrike Physics a total of three times and averaging those scores out to give a good representation of what the G2120 is capable of, at least in synthetic benchmarks like this. At stock speed, the G2120 managed scores of 2,971, 2,966 and 2,942 for an average of 2,959.67 points. With overclocking, if you expected a similar increase in scores to Cinebench, you'd be right. As with the 3.29 GHz overclock, the tests saw scores of 3,160, 3,169 and 3,134 points respectively, for an average score of 3,154.33, a 6.58% increase over stock. To kick off the games today, it's the ever popular Grand Theft Auto V, which had its much anticipated PC release in April of 2015, over a year after the initial release on consoles, and despite its age, it's still a great game to benchmark today. I'm running the game at both stock and overclocked speeds, 1080p, using the lowest settings possible with DirectX 11 to maintain consistency with all my previous tests. 
One thing to note though is that for the overclocked run, I had to reduce the base clock to 106.1 MHz, as 106.2 MHz wasn't stable. This reduced the processor speed to 3.288 GHz and the memory to 1697 MHz. And before we even started, the game actually crashed at stock clocks while loading into the story mode. However, it never happened again and didn't happen at all with the overclock. Throughout the city, it both showed some noticeable issues with MicroStar. FPS throughout the city sat around the mid 30s up to around 60 frames per second, which is fairly similar to the overclock's performance, although that managed to not go below the low 40s. Neither showed any issues with input lag or input locking, which is common in this game with underpowered processors, and both did in fact seem to run smooth at points in the map, although overall both did show some micro stutter at points throughout the whole test and not just in the city. Interestingly though, I noticed that with the overclock, the G2120 actually showed slightly worse stutter than stock did. The FRAPS 15 minute benchmark showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 47, 25 and 18 frames per second respectively at stock speeds, and there were several spikes in frame times throughout of around 40 to 60 milliseconds, with several more reaching 160 milliseconds at the worst. The overclock showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 52, 28 and 20 frames per second respectively, showing a minor improvement overall. It also showed several spikes in frame times of around 100 to 280 milliseconds throughout the test. With Rise of the Tomb Raider, I was expecting a poor performance overall, given that this is the most modern game on the list of tests today. I'm also running the game at 1080p with the lowest settings possible using DirectX 11, and like Grand Theft Auto V, I had to leave the base clock at 106.1 MHz to maintain stability in the overclock test. Stock clocks did indeed show a fair amount of stutter, although admittedly not as much as I expected. At the start of both tests, the game did actually appear to run smoothly at points, although that didn't last particularly long, and was the exception to how the rest of the game performed, as at times, stock clocks showed some fairly significant stuttering, especially in areas of the Soviet installation and the copper mill, which was also true for the overclock as well, albeit less so than stock clocks. One positive from both tests though, is that combat was actually reasonably okay, which makes a change to how hard it is on some lower powered processors. The FRAPS 15 minute benchmark showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 51, 19 and 9 frames per second respectively, and according to the frame time graph, there were several spikes in frame times of around 40 to 240 milliseconds, with the most severe spike reaching a whopping 1.42 seconds. The overclock on the other hand though, showed 57, 22 and 10 frames per second for its average 1% and 0.1% lows respectively, and showed spikes in frame times of around 100 to 200 milliseconds at the worst. However, I'd personally say that the game with the overclock is kind of playable if you can put up with the stutter. And despite being seven years on from its initial 2012 release, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, or CSGO as it's more commonly known, is still massively popular and even has a fairly substantial professional scene today as well. It runs on quite a wide range of hardware, so it's a great game for benchmarking low-powered or older processors with. I'm running the test in a hard difficulty competitive bot match on the Mirage map at 1080p on the lowest settings possible to maintain consistency with my previous CPU tests. And unlike GTA 5 and Rise of the Tomb Raider, CSGO ran perfectly fine with the base clock at 106.2 MHz for its overclocked run, so it was running at a slightly higher processor and memory speed than what the previous two games managed. As I was expecting, the game runs fantastically, even at stock speeds. Neither the stock or overclock test showed any noticeable stuttering or locking up whatsoever, other than on one occasion with the overclock in which I noticed a brief judder. Performance was perfect otherwise though. Stock clocks managed FPS in the range of the low 50s up to around 125 frames per second depending on the location of the map you are in, with the overclock managing to better this with FPS in the range of 70 to 140 frames per second. As mentioned, it both ran perfectly fine with no issues throughout the entire test, so there isn't really much else to say about the game, other than that stock clocks managed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 98, 58 and 44 frames per second respectively. And despite having no noticeable star, the frame time graph does indeed show that there was some, with spikes in frame times of around 70 to 100 milliseconds throughout the test, although they are spaced so far apart that you won't notice them. The overclock on the other hand managed 110, 62 and 46 frames per second, for its average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates, and also had spikes in frame times throughout of around 50 to 80 milliseconds, which like stock, are spaced far enough apart to be unnoticeable. Lastly for the test today is Warframe, a personal favourite of mine which is also free to play. 
it's available from Steam or through the Warframe website itself. This is also ran at 1080p on the lowest settings possible using the DirectX 11 mode, although through the Warframe launcher you can select DirectX 10 mode as well if you don't have a DirectX 11 capable graphics card. The test was run in a 15 minute survival mission on Jupiter. As you can see from the average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates, the overclock overall actually performed a bit worse on paper than stock clocks did, although in terms of the actual experience the overclock did show better performance at times. On the lander craft, stock clocks had the FPS hitting as high as the mid 270s and only dropping to around the mid 180s, whereas the overclock never dropped below 200 frames per second and hit almost 300 at points of the ship. Neither showed any stuttering or locking up here at all, and both ran pretty smoothly on the planet selection screen as well. Throughout the mission itself though, the game again ran extremely well, and both stayed well above 60 frames per second for the entirety of the test, with FPS in the low 80s to around 135 frames per second at times for stock clocks. The overclock though dropped to the mid 70s at times, but saying that, some points of the mission were actually more intense in terms of the action on screen compared to my run with stock clocks so performance was probably extremely similar overall. Neither showed any stuttering or locking up throughout the entire mission and both were extremely enjoyable and very playable. The Fraps benchmark showed an average of 101 frames per second at stock clocks, with 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 65 and 55 frames per second respectively, with no spikes in frame times other than on one occasion where there was a spike of 40 milliseconds. The overclock managed the exact same average frame rate, but was slightly reduced 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 62 and 51 frames per second respectively, showing that there were more dips in the frame rate, but as mentioned, some points of the mission were more intense. There was also only one spike in frame times of 40 milliseconds, much like stock clocks. Overall, I was actually quite impressed at how well the G2120 performed in some reasonably modern games. It was never intended for gaming, and yet it offers some very playable levels of performance in games such as CSGO and Warframe. More CPU intensive games such as Rise of the Tomb Raider will struggle, although even with Rise, their performance with an overclock would be tolerable, at least to me anyway, if the G2120 is all I had. GTA 5 with an overclock is also kind of playable too. For the £4 I paid for the G2120, it was an absolute bargain, and would probably run a lot of older games just fine, or at least to a playable enough level. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and leaving a comment as well. I'd also really appreciate it if you could share this with anyone you think may enjoy it. If you'd like to support me in creating these videos, you could subscribe to my channel and maybe even consider supporting me through Patreon at patreon.com slash benchinggaming or through Kofi at kofi.com slash benchinggaming. You don't have to, but I'd be eternally grateful if you did. Unfortunately, I'm struggling to get my hands on more DDR2 RAM, so this may be the last video for a few weeks, at least until CEX gets their stuff together and manages to actually send what I ordered. Small rant aside, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something from it. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one. And if not, thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch my content. I really do appreciate it. Mm -hmm.